Hi guys, um, I'm here today to talk to you about creating um, space with color. Um, so as we enter into this kind of last phase of our painting, where we are really trying to, um, I guess, think through our compositions, um, I do want you to consider color, um, how you plan on using and how you plan on using it, and you know how that's going to help you create space. So um, some of the things we've already talked about, we've already worked with landscape and we've learned some techniques for creating space. Um, these include using foreground, middle ground, background. Uh, these also include uh, thinking about the diminishing scale of objects as you get deeper into space. So things that are very close to you um, are going to be larger. You know, things that are far away from you are going to be smaller as they move up to the horizon line. Um, this can also apply to something more abstract like mark, you know, sometimes we will see an artist making larger marks in the foreground and smaller marks in the background to create that sense of space. Um, also, we have um, overlapping. Overlapping is going to be a great tool for creating space. If we look at the Jen Aranyi painting in the bottom, of course, we see our tent is overlapping our trees. Um, so our foreground is overlapping our middle ground. And those trees, of course, are um, overlapping the background of the sky. We do see some diminishing scale in the middle ground of the trees as well. Um, all those things are going to help to create space. Remember, you know, even though um, that those tools and techniques were the focus for our last assignment, that doesn't mean um, because we're doing something new that you shouldn't still use those. Keep using those tools um, to create space in your artwork as you move forward. Everything, I guess, you know, it's important to know that everything you learn in art is, you know, it builds upon everything else. So once you get a tool and learn how to use it, keep using it in your work. Um, the next thing we're kind of moving into is color and how color creates space. Um, we're trying to consider um, how color can create the illusion of depth and space. Um, we're dealing specifically with watercolor paints in this project, but what we learn about color here, um, just like we said, talked about generalizing the skills we learned in the previous assignment with Generani and watercolor painting uh, to create depth. Um, the skills we learn here can be generalized into other 2D art mediums, such as drawing, um, photography, um, digital art, um, anything 2D where you're trying to create the illusion of space, we can use these color techniques for. Um, so there are a couple of um, rules, I guess um, we could say when it comes to color. Um, rules, uh, you know, is a, a weird term, I guess, um, because, you know, as we are going to learn today, um, these rules can be broken um, and bent um, by artists. Um, maybe a better way to think of these as um, tendencies of color, habits of color, <laughs> um, uh, ways that colors typically interact with each other. Um, so if we look um, at this painting here, A Secret Forest, um, you can see that typically in artwork, uh, warmer, lighter colors are going to move forward to your eye in space, while darker colors tend to recede. Um, so you can see the lighter, warmer, colors of the leaves coming forward off of the trees um, as the cooler, darker colors of the background recede and create that sort of feeling of space and distance in this painting. Uh, we can also see the tree branches themselves, they are cooler um, than the leaves at the top, but as they get lighter, um, the tree branches, um, sorry, the tree trunks, uh, tree trunks seem to move forward to our eye. So, you know, cooler uh, colors are going to recede, um, warmer colors are going to move forward, um, lighter colors are going to move forward, uh, darker colors are going to move back, typically. Um, of course, you know, color is relative um, to the other colors that are around it. Um, so, if we just kind of looked at this painting, you know, you might say, oh, these colors in general 
are cool. I see blues, I see greens. Um, but within the context of this kind of analogous color scheme, so colors are next to each other on the color wheel, um, the yellow greens are warmer like than the blue greens or the greens or the blues. So Van Gogh has used um, those um, sort of warm yellows and yellowy greens. And also if you look in that middle ground, you're gonna see a little bit of white mixed in with some yellows. Like those move that middle ground forward to the eye where the, the cooler blues uh, tend to recede. He's used those back on the horizon line and in the sky um, because he wants to create a sense of depth. Um, one thing you, you will notice here too is that down in the lower corner, he's created a little pocket of shadow um, by using darker, cooler colors. Um, that kind of serves to create more depth in the whole painting um, because of the contrast, um, that dark pocket in the front is pushed forward. Um, despite the dark colors, normal tendencies to recede is pushed forward because it's overlapping that warm, bright area. This is a great example too of an artist using scale and mark, right, um, to create depth. You look at how Van Gogh used bigger brush strokes in the foreground, bigger, longer brush strokes to make that area seem like it's moving forward. As we move into that middle ground, he's using these really short um, staccato brush marks. And as he moves, as you move way, way, way back to that tall cypress tree in the background, look at how tiny those marks are back there, right? Uh, Van Gogh really pushes the envelope with using mark to create space. All right, so here is um, a good example of um, an exception to this cool colors receding, warm colors coming forward, and sort of dark colors receding, um, light colors, um, I'm sorry, dark colors receding, uh, light colors moving forward rule. So if you, um, if your foreground is dark and cool, as these are, um, the contrast of lighter, warmer colors in the background is going to create depth. Um, so this gives you a feeling of backlighting, right? So the light is coming from deep in the, um, the picture plane, far away, and it is illuminating um, and backlighting the dark, darker, closer um, foreground in this case. I mean, uh, one way to think about it is this, you know, we've seen some examples already here of, you know, this is a clear example of, um, you know, a, an artist using the opposite of what we would think to make something recede dark, cool in the foreground. Um, it is important to think about contrast, you know, foreground, middle ground, background, can you create some contrast um, in color structure? And that's gonna create depth. So, you know, if you start with cool in the foreground, you know, moving toward uh, warm in the dark can help to create some of that contrast and depth. Um, let's see what else we have. Saturated colors. Um, so another property of color, right? Um, we just talked about warm and cool. Another proper, we also talked about value because we talked about light and dark. Another property of color is saturation, right? Saturation is how intense a color is. Um, Remember, you know, when we're making our color wheels, um, you can desaturate a color in several different ways. You can mix it with white and you get a tint. You can mix it with gray and you get a tone, or you can mix it with black and you get a shade. Um, you can also desaturate a color by mixing it with its complement, so the opposite color on the color wheel. Um, so how do saturated colors function to create space? Um, typically, when we're looking at artwork, uh, saturated colors are going to move forward in space where desaturated colors move backward in space. Oh dear, this actually says <laughs> that both of them move forward. So um, listen to my words and not what is on your screen. So saturated colors are going to move forward in space while desaturated colors are gonna move back. So this image from Kung Fu Panda shows that really well. So the most intense colors here are in the foreground. So if we look at the animals, we see that intensity of color. 
as we look in the background, we get these um, tints of color, right? So all these colors are mixed with white. Um, they're desaturated in other ways, so they're not as intense. Like if this is orange, it's got a lot of blue mixed in with it. Um, this purple um, or, or this red violet, this tint of red violet is very dingy, right? So that creates that movement backward in space um, and pushes it back. Our, color, our eyes just tend to read um, more saturated colors as closer in space. Um, now, there are always exceptions, of course. Um, backlighting um, proves to be such a, um, a challenge um, again and again in artwork. Um, so with this painting by Gustav Klimt, um, he, you might know his painting, The Kiss, as it is like reproduced so many times in um, uh, posters and things uh, that people like to hang on their walls. But um, this is one of his landscape paintings. Um, I don't know, I really kind of like his landscape paintings better than those others. Um, but the point of us looking at this painting right now, I digress. The point of us looking at this painting right now is look at the color, right? It feels like the colors in the foreground are less intense by the colors than the colors in the background. We do get some more intense greens and reds as we move into the light over here as we're in this sort of deep shadow inside the wooded area, um, the colors are more dingy. So this is a good example of, you know, the opposite being true. You know, the artist is using contrast, you know, but actually in this case, the warmer, I'm sorry, the more saturated intense colors are in the background and the more muted dingy colors are in the foreground to create that effect of looking out from the shadow. Um, now, some paintings uh, break every rule um, and still work. Um, often artists will, you know, break like rules of traditional color structure um, to, for an effect. Um, so this is the screen by Edward Munch. Um, and let's see, what is Munch doing that breaks like those rules of color that we talked about in a way that is surprising? Well, he puts if, if you look at the background, the furthest thing from our eye, right, that horizon line, the sky, he puts the most intense <laughs> color there. So that's the most saturated color. It's also the warmest color. Um, so that bright kind of red, especially against that um, blue back there, right, it looks so intense and warm. Um, so that functions to bring the furthest thing away from us spatially, like right up to our eye, like immediately we pay attention to it. Um, we do have like the other rules of space that create depth in this painting. So we've got some perspective, perspective on the bridge. We've got diminishment and scale from the figure, from the ghostly sort of figure in the foreground to the figures in the background, to even like the distant kind of like ships. We do have that diminishment in scale, but color kind of contradicts all of those things. We've got this really intense, like violent, like warm color, like in the background, and it just kind of charges forward in space and dominates like your attention in a way. So, I mean, for me, like when I look at this painting, the effect is like very nauseating. It's like, it's it feels like it's made intended to make the viewer feel a little bit like queasy, like space is very strange here. And I think, you know, um, Edward Munch's intention in making this was to make a space that did indeed make the viewer feel uneasy. He said that, you know, when he made this painting, he was walking across a bridge with some friends and um, he stood back for a moment and saw the, um, the sunset turn this incredibly you know, um, red color. And it was just so striking. He said it felt like um, the landscape was screaming at him. And so the screen, he, he felt, he said he felt like a scream go through nature. A lot of people think that, right, the figure in the foreground is screaming because of their mouth. But look, he's covering his ears, right? He feels as though he's being screamed at by nature. Um, can be another sort of in interpretation. Um, so yeah, I mean, I think it's fascinating to think about color and maybe how it can, the, the typical rules of color and creating space with color can be, 
you know, bent or broken to, to create an effect, um, and to create a mood and a work of art. Um, really interesting to think about. So, um, for you guys, um, what I would like you to do, um, your assignment is to find a color mentor for your painting. All right. So by that, I mean, I want you to find a painting out in the world, um, that, um, it inspires you um, and kind of in a way illustrates how you want to use uh, color in your hybrid animal painting. Uh, I'm going to offer some links um, for doing some image searches at galleries and museums. Um, we're going to look at your color mentor um, in our discussion. So what I want you to do is identify the work and the artist, uh, tell why you chose it, also, and then say how the artist used color to create space. Say what you want to bring uh, to your work from what you observe in the piece. Uh, finally, you're going to post your answer in our group discussion. So my example is this. Uh, this painting is Midsummer Eve by Robert Hughes. I chose this artwork to learn from as I am also making a painting of a glowing creature set in a forest at night. Hughes uses color to create depth by putting the bright, warm areas toward the front and uh, the cooler, darker areas toward the back. I also noticed that he puts a little wedge of cool, dark color at the very bottom of the painting to create depth through contrast. Um, I want to use what I learned from this painting to put my, um, and put my deeper, darker blues in the background and my lighter, warmer colors to the front. If I want to um, create the feeling the moon rabbit is glowing, I will have to think about how to highlight the landscape as though it were the light source. All right. Um, so again, I'm going to provide you guys some links um, to help with research. Um, we are looking for um, sort of a role model that you can learn from um, in terms of how to use color to create space. Pick one, um, pick, pick an artist um, whose work you like um, that uses uh, color to create space. Um, it doesn't have to be, you know, a really similar subject to what you're doing. You're not necessarily looking for a painting of an animal. It can be really any painting um, that uses color to create space um, that, you know, you might model your color after. All right. Um, well, I will look forward to uh, seeing who your artist mentors are and what your thoughts are about how they use color.